Hello, and welcome to this presentation on uh, wide fan gap semiconductor materials and microwave power amplifiers with a specific focus on gallium nitride transistors. I am Dr. Francesco Fornetti and I will be your presenter today. First of all, I'd like to give you a bit of background about myself. I uh, went to university to do an undergraduate degree in uh, elect electrical and electronic engineering at Bristol University and subsequently I went to work for Rolls-Royce Civil Aviation Division as a control systems engineer. I then joined Motorola as a radio frequency engineer and uh, during my time at Motorola I worked on uh, GSM base station transceivers and also on 3G access point as well as uh, WiMAX base stations which operated at 3.5 gigahertz. I then came back to academia to do a uh, PhD sponsored by MBDA Missile Systems and uh, during my PhD I investigated gallium nitride in terms of its physics and the devices that can be fabricated uh, with it. I also designed and characterized uh, pulsed amplifiers uh, based on gallium nitride transistors and um, finally I had the opportunity to work at the University of Sydney uh, and uh, do some bespoke uh, device level characterization of gallium nitride high electromobility transistors. If you're not familiar with this acronym yet, don't worry, we'll be uh, going through that uh, later on in the presentation. So I'd like to now give you an overview of what we'll be going through today. First of all, we'll talk a little bit about uh, microwave power amplifiers and particularly ones that operate at very high power and what options are available. And uh, then we'll compare uh, vacuum electron devices, which are very powerful um, devices that can be used for uh, radio frequency and microwave power amplification, to solid state transistors. We'll then have a look at various semiconductor materials and talk about what are the desirable properties for a semiconductor material. We'll then move on to heterostructures and modulation doping, which are at the very heart of high frequency transistors, uh, what we mentioned before as a high electromobility transistors. And then we'll move on to those very transistors and in particular the ones that are fabricated on uh, gallium nitride. We'll take a look at the pros and cons of this material and uh, uh, gallium nitride devices. And then we'll have a look at the issues. This is quite a novel material and hence there are still unresolved issues um, and we'll have a, a chat about that. Finally, uh, we'll have a look at the commercial availability of gallium nitride transistors and then we'll come to some conclusions. So, let's make a start. First of all, let's talk a little bit about uh, power amplifiers, particularly those that require very high power levels. Well, transmitters that are to be used in radar and wireless communication systems require a very high upper power, particularly a base station level or ground station level in the case of radar. And uh, this power can go up to hundreds and thousands of watts. Now for some of these systems we can use solid state um, devices uh, which are able to generate um, power of the order of kilowatts but uh, of course um, this is not done by a single device we have to use power combining or phased array techniques. Some systems however still require uh, a performance and output power levels uh, which are not available from solid state devices and hence uh, some systems still to this day need to resort to microwave vacuum tube devices because solid state can't cut it either um, in terms of the power that it can produce or the frequency that it can operate at or both. So uh, let's have a look at what the current technology status is for high power microwave PAs. This uh, graph summarizes what can be done with solid state in red and what can be done with vacuum electron devices, VEDs, in uh, green. Uh, it is obvious to see that um, uh, VEDs can actually produce um, orders of magnitudes greater powers than solid state devices and also they can go further up in frequency. On this graph we're only showing uh, gallium arsenide uh, MESFETs or PHEMPs and silicon carbide MESFETs in terms of solid state devices. But we'll be seeing in due course how gallium nitride can actually, can actually improve 
on the overall performance of solid state devices and how um, it bridges the gap a little bit between vacuum electron devices and solid state. So, uh, vacuum electron devices, what are they? Um, some of uh, these you'll be familiar with, for example, the magnetron, um, but also there are traveling wave tubes and klystron modulators. They're usually quite big, heavy, and bulky. Apart maybe from the magnetron, they're s quite small and compact. Solid state devices, of course, come in two varieties. You get packaged devices and also bare dyes, which are shown in the picture. So let's talk a little bit about solid state microwave transistors. Why is it better to use solid state than it would be to use um, vacuum electron devices? Well, first of all, uh, solid state devices don't require a great deal of maintenance, whereas, for instance, um, the uh, VEDs require the vacuum to be replenished regularly. They can operate instantaneously, whereas a lot of uh, these um, bulky uh, vacuum electron devices need what's called a hot cathode. So you need to let them warm up and reach a certain temperature before they can operate properly. The power supplies for uh, solid state devices tend to operate at lower voltages and, uh, and hence they tend to be cheaper and lighter. The uh, uh, reliability and durability is actually also better and you have a much improved um, mean time between failures. Solid state devices also offer graceful degradation. That is because power amplifiers um, designed uh, with solid state devices usually comprise of a number of transistors and hence if one fails uh, you can still have some performance um, rather than having a catastrophic failure uh, where um, the device doesn't work at all. Also, solid state offers a much wider bandwidth. In fact, uh, VEDs offer between 10 and 20 percent uh, bandwidth, whereas solid state can offer up to 50 percent. And of course, um, very important is the fact that amplifiers based on solid state tend to be lighter and much less bulky, which is very important in applications, for example, in space applications and satellites and exploration probes, uh, but also, for example, WAVs and manned uh, aerial vehicles, where the space and the weight come at a premium. So, why uh, are solid state devices less powerful than VEDs? Well, in uh, vacuum electron devices, as the name suggests, uh, the electrons go through vacuum and hence encounter very little resistance. They don't tend to scatter and hit the lattice of a semiconductor as they would in a solid state device. And hence, uh, their speed is usually better in a, in a VED than it is in a, a solid state device. There are also thermal limitations um, with solid state devices because you have to be able to extract heat uh, quite efficiently and effectively in order to produce high powers. Otherwise, you may be able perhaps to produce high powers but you would burn the device out. Also, another very important point is that the bias voltage that you can apply to solid state devices is much lower than that of VEDs. And power being current times voltage, if the voltage is reduced, then the output power is also reduced. So, let's talk a little bit more about uh, the reason why uh, lower bias voltages uh, limit amplifier performance. When uh, we have a limited voltage um, applied to the uh, terminals of our device, then we have to produce uh, more current to achieve uh, high power. High current operation is inefficient because, as we mentioned before, uh, you're going through a semiconductor material. There's going to be um, a lot of collisions uh, between the electrons and the lattice of the semiconductor, which then cause uh, serious losses. The other problem that you will encounter is that to have a higher current you will need to increase the cross-sectional area uh, through which the electrons can flow. Now if you increase the uh, cross-sectional area of the device inherently you will have a higher capacitance because the capacitance is proportional. For example in a parallel plate capacitor the capacitance is proportional to the area of the plates. So you will end up with high capacitance and also lower impedance. Think about the fact that impedance is voltage divided by current. So increases the, increasing the current obviously decreases the impedance. 
So we'll be looking now at uh, two very good performance indicators of um, microwave transistors. Uh, FT, um, which is called the cutoff frequency or gain bandwidth product, and Fmax, which is um, the uh, maximum frequency of, of oscillation, or so is termed. So FT is the frequency at which the short circuit current gain uh, falls to unity. Um, and Fmax is the uh, frequency at which the unilateral power gain falls to unity. Now, ideally, you'd want both of these values to be as high as possible. Now, if you have an increased uh, capacitance, which you would have if you wanted to have more current flowing through and hence uh, increase the um, area of the device, then, as you can see, your maximum frequency, uh, um, the, the cutoff frequency, will be obviously reduced because CGS will increase. Now, if max is also depending on, on, on FT, so an increase in capacitance will also decrease F max, but then also um, F max is dependent on the uh, square root of RDS, the resistance between drain and source. Now, as we said, if you increase the current that flows between drain and source, then the impedance between these two terminals, impedance being voltage divided by current, is going to be also lower. And that is going to decrease your F max as well. So, what are the properties of semiconductor materials which are very desirable uh, for microwave transistors. Well, first of all, we'd like a high breakdown field. That is the maximum internal field that the uh, semiconductor can withstand before it breaks down. If you have a high breakdown field, then you can apply a large terminal voltage, and obviously this translates in a much higher RF output power. Now, uh, we can see on this table various uh, semiconductor materials and their main properties. Now, wide band gap semiconductor materials, we'll be talking about what that exactly means in a minute, um, like silicon carbide, gallium nitride and diamond at the bottom of the table, exhibit a uh, much higher breakdown field than other semiconductor materials, in fact, up to an order of magnitude higher. So, how do we achieve a high breakdown field? Well, the breakdown field is directly related to the uh, band gap of the semiconductor, i.e. the difference between the valence and conduction band energy uh, in the semiconductor material. A large energy gap gives you the ability to support uh, high internal electric fields. For those of you who need a bit of a refresher uh, as to how the uh, semiconductor band diagram works, uh, the uh, Valence electrons, which are the electrons in the outermost orbit of the semiconductor atoms, occupy energy states uh, in the valence band. And above the top of the valence band, uh, there is a forbidden gap, which is followed by the conduction band, uh, which is occupied by free electrons. So, uh, if we take a look at our table again, we can see that gallium nitride and, and diamond uh, are, have the highest uh, band gaps of all semiconductors, and this is what allows them to have a very high breakdown field, which is advantageous to produce high RF output powers. The other uh, good uh, feature of a semiconductor material is a load electric constant. If you have a load electric constant, then you end up having a much lower capacitive loading because uh, the capacitance is proportional to the electric constant and to the uh, overall area. And hence, if you uh, have a lower electric constant, you can then uh, increase the area of the device, keeping the impedance the same, and having a larger area allows you to have higher RF currents. So again, we can see uh, from this table that um, a wide bang up semiconductor materials, so semiconductor materials which have a large difference between the top of the valence band and the bottom of the conduction band, uh, like silicon carbide, gallium nitride and diamond, have a lower electric constant, which allows you, uh, again, to have uh, considerable advantages at RF and microwave frequencies. 
The other good thing uh, that we'd want to have in a semiconductor material is good thermal conductance. Um, so we'd like to be able to um, extract the power from the device quite efficiently and effectively. So we need a material that conducts heat very well. Now if we come back to our table, we can see the diamond is spectacular in terms of thermal conductance um, and silicon carbide is also very good. However, gallium nitride is not particularly good. In fact, it's worse than silicon. Having said that, uh, we have to bear in mind that gallium nitride transistors are mostly these days fabricated on silicon carbide. And silicon carbide has excellent thermal properties. So um, it so happens that the heat can be extracted very well from gallium nitride transistor because of the uh, substrate they're built on. So we've spoken a little bit about uh, uh, how to increase uh, the uh, voltage that can be applied across the terminals of a semiconductor material. We spoke about uh, the uh, thermal conductance uh, and uh, the ability to extract heat um, and also the ability to um, change uh, the impedance to our advantage through a uh, lowered electric constant. Now let's talk a little bit about currents because of course power is the product of voltage and current and hence as, as well as increasing the voltage we like to be able to increase the current as well. Now current is defined as the movement of charge and it's expressed as the product between charge density and transport velocity. So um, both uh, charge density and transport velocity must be high in order for us to achieve uh, high currents. Now, uh, there are two main parameters uh, in a semiconductor material which tell us how um, fast the electrons move. The first one is the one shown here, the carrier mobility, um, and that is defined as the slope of the uh, uh, velocity versus field characteristic a low electric field. Uh, what we're saying here is that we are applying an electric field to our semiconductor material uh, which is relatively low so we're talking about less than 10 kilovolts per centimeters maybe less than 5 kilovolts per centimeters in fact and we're looking at how well the electrons respond uh, to uh, fast changing stimuli uh, when the, uh, their amplitude is relatively low so a, a low electric field is applied and um, we define a figure of merit which is called the carrier mobility and is defined as the slope of the uh, curves that you're seeing on the screen uh, which represent the velocity versus the electric field um, at uh, low uh, electric field levels. From this diagram it may appear that um, uh, most of the semiconductors have got similar uh, carrier mobility because the slope of the, these curves uh, appears to be quite quite similar. However, if we look at uh, a different graph which has got a linear scale on the x-axis rather than the logarithmic scale that we've just seen, we can see how gallium arsenide, for instance, has a much, much higher carrier mobility than gallium nitride or silicon carbide. Remember that the carrier mobility tells you how well the electrons respond to fast changing fields uh, when their um, intensity is relatively low. This is what makes gallium arsenide a fantastic material for um, low noise amplifiers because at low electric fields it can respond to high frequency incredibly well. The electrons can really uh, move, really shift. The other figure of merit that we look at in uh, semiconductor materials is the saturated velocity. The saturated velocity is the velocity that the carriers can obtain when um, the field applied is much higher. Uh, in fact, is, uh, we are looking at the velocity that they acquire at a point when increasing the field further doesn't bring any further increase in velocity. Now we can uh, look again at our diagram and see what happens at higher electric fields. You can see, for example, that the saturated velocity of gallium arsenide is actually quite low and the saturated velocity of silicon is, is higher than gallium arsenide, for instance. Now, uh, for uh, silicon carbide, we can see how the saturated velocity is clearly higher than both silicon and gallium arsenide. 
For gallium nitride, the curves are a little bit trickier to obtain, and we'll again return to the graph uh, with a linear scale, which shows uh, the saturated velocity of gallium nitride a little bit better. We can see here that although we don't get a perfectly flat line, the um, velocity at high electric fields in silicon carbide and gallium nitride is much higher than that in gallium arsenide. Now, as we said, uh, as well as the um, velocity of the electrons, what's important is having a very high charge density, which can contribute uh, to higher currents. So, what I'd like to do now is briefly touch on, on microwave MESFETs, which are uh, devices which are often used to amplify uh, microwave frequencies. MESFETs are majority carrier devices which are based on n-type semiconductors. The reason for that is that electrons are much faster than holes which you would get with a p-type uh, doping and of course as we looked at just now you want to have the highest velocity possible for your carriers. Uh, you want to have carriers that can respond to fast changing electric fields very well. They have a Schottky gate uh, which is a junction between a metal and a semiconductor. Um, this is as opposed to MOSFETs where the uh, gate uh, then has a layer of uh, dielectric underneath it before it gets to uh, the uh, semiconductor material. And having this direct um, metal semiconductor junction uh, reduces the overall capacitance which as we've seen before improves the frequency performance of the transistor and also higher trans it gives you higher transconductance which translates into higher gains. The practical maximum frequencies that have been achieved uh, with this type of devices is a, a Ka band, so up to around 40 gigahertz. And at 40 gigahertz the power is limited to about 1 watt. Now we uh, are moving on to a different type of device, which is uh, a star performer when it comes to high uh, frequency. And this type of device is called a HEMT, uh, a high electron mobility transistor. The one shown in the figure here is a uh, aluminium gallium arsenide, gallium arsenide uh, transistor. And you can see that uh, it consists of the uh, same contacts that you would get in a MESFET uh, with a gate, a source and a drain. But then um, you again have a short key junction between the gate and the semiconductor underneath it. But after that, you get a different type of semiconductor. So you're basically s uh, fabricating two layers of different semiconductors, one on top of the other. And this has a number of advantages, which we will be going through in a second. So let's talk about heterostructures and modulation doping. So, what is a heterostructure? A heterostructure is a structure which consists of at least two layers of different semiconductor materials with distinct band gaps. And the interface uh, between these two layers is called a heterojunction or a heterointerface. Now, uh, having a, a structure like this allows you to um, have modulation doping. Modulation doping offers an important advantage in device engineering because it provides a mechanism by which uh, the free carrier concentration within a semiconductor layer can be increased significantly but without the introduction of uh, dopant impurities. Conventional uh, doping techniques can of course significantly increase the free carrier concentration and conductivity of the semiconductor also but they come at the expense of an increased ionized impurity scattering and a concomitant reduction in the carrier mobility and speed of the device. By ionized impurity scattering, we mean the collisions and scattering by electrically charged impurities and crystal imperfections. Modulation doping, on the other hand, allows the free carrier concentration to be increased significantly but without compromising the mobility. So, to have modulation doping, you must have a heterostructure. So what happens when you grow uh, a semiconductor material with a wider band gap on top of one with a lower band gap, as we can see in the diagram? 
So we can see that the uh, conduction band in the aluminium gallium arsenide side lies energetically higher than that on the gallium arsenide side. And because the electrons tend to occupy the lowest uh, allowed energy state, then they're encouraged to move from the aluminium gallium arsenide side to the gallium arsenide side. And this, of course, increases the concentration of the electrons in the gallium arsenide material without the introduction of any donor impurities. Of course, you've got charges uh, left behind on the aluminium gallium arsenide uh, side, which balance out the net negative charge, which is due to the electrons transferred into the gallium arsenide layer. And obviously, this, uh, d this positive charges which are left behind do affect the electrons in the gallium arsenide side. But because there is special separation between the two charged species, uh, the Coulomb interaction between them is mitigated. And as a result, the impurity scattering of the transferred electrons is reduced and uh, a higher electron mobility is achieved. Now, we can see that when you actually uh, grow one semiconductor material on top of the other, you end up with uh, quite a complex band structure. And um, I'd like to give you a little bit of an insight into uh, how that can be intuitively understood. So we can see that the conduction band edge in the gallium arsenide layer is strongly bent near the hetero interface. Now remember that uh, this uh, line represents the energy of the electrons in the conduction band. So the band bending is actually a consequence of the electron transfer. Now, if we uh, drew a Gaussian surface around the entire system, uh, both the aluminium gallium arsenide and the gallium arsenide material, we would observe a zero net charge. The system, after all, has to be space charge neutral. However, as an electron in uh, the uh, aluminium gallium arsenide side approaches the gallium arsenide side, it sees a net negative charge. And this negative charge acts to raise its energy. And because the band represents the energy of the electron, the band actually bend upward um, to signify this increase in the energy of the electron. From the other side, as an electron is moved from the gallium arsenide side towards the aluminium gallium arsenide size, it sees a net positive charge, which is due to the ionized donors present in the aluminium gallium arsenide material. So the closer the electron gets to uh, the interface, the more net positive charge it sees. And this reduces its energy, hence the band uh, bend downwards. The presence of this conduction band edge discontinuity forms a notch uh, in the conduction band, as you can see, uh, of the narrow gap material. And the electrons within this region of the semiconductor are confined in a triangular well-like potential. Within this potential well, uh, spatial quantization occurs, and spatial quantization produces discrete energy bands called subbands in the potential well. The direction of quantization is perpendicular to the hetero interface, and the energy along this direction is quantized. However, in the directions parallel to the interface, effectively x and y, no spatial quantization effects occur since the motion of the electrons is not restricted by the band bending. Therefore, the electrons behave, really, as free particles for motion along the x and y axis, which are those parallel to the interface, but are quantized in the z direction. And this means that they can only move in a two-dimensional plane, parallel to the hetero interface, but not perpendicular to it, because of the two potential barriers confining the potential well, which are represented by the dotted lines um, in the diagram. The electrons confined within this uh, potential well are called two-dimensional electron gas, which is shortened as 2-deg. So, what are the main advantages of modulation doping? First of all, we get a free carrier concentration increase without uh, introducing significant dopant impurities. And remember that, inasmuch as uh, the currents that we can have 
uh, are d dependent on the saturated velocity and the carrier mobility, uh, they are also very much dependent on the charge density. So increasing the uh, carrier concentration without introducing dopamine impurity is very good. The other good thing is that the uh, spatial separation between uh, the dopants and the free carriers means that um, the uh, ionized impurity scattering um, is reduced. Um, remember that the ionized impurity scattering represents the collisions and the scattering by electrically charged impurities and crystal imperfection. So if you reduced uh, all these collisions and scattering, you end up having higher mobility for your electrons. The other good thing is that we get a very good electron confinement within the two-dimensional electron gas. As we've just seen, uh, you end up having electrons confined to a potential well, and they can only move in the x and y direction, but not in the z direction, which means they're very much confined to the interface between the two material to your hetero interface. So, uh, this is the structure of a gallium nitride hemmed. Um, so the principles are very much the same as uh, the ones that we've seen uh, for um, aluminium gallium arsenide and, and gallium arsenide hemmed. Uh, the construction is, is pretty much uh, similar, but of course the materials have uh, different properties. This actually is quite a, a real construction for the hemmed. Uh, we saw a simplified model before. So let's take a look at the various bits and uh, what they actually uh, represent. So we've got the typical contacts that um, most of you will be familiar with, source drain and gate, same as you would have in MOSFETs or MESFETs. Then we've got a cap layer, which consists of undoped gallium nitride or aluminium gallium nitride, and is followed by the um, aluminium gallium nitride barrier layer. The gallium nitride part of the uh, layer structure consists of the actual channel layer and a thick buffer layer. Uh, finally, the nucleation layer is necessary to control the polarity of the uh, GAN and ALGAN layers. Um, this is quite a specific bit of information, but you need uh, a gallium phase polarity uh, for things to actually work. And um, the nucleation layer is also used to uh, realize a monocrystalline growth of these layers um, in spite of the considerably mismatched uh, substrate. The entire layer sequence can be grown uh, epitaxially, for example, uh, on uh, sapphire, silicon carbide, or silicon substrates. The gate uh, here is uh, a mushroom gate, uh, which is uh, a shape which improves the frequency performance of the device and also uh, acts to decrease its uh, resistance and improve the noise figure of the device. And uh, it can also be recessed, although this is not the case in the one shown here. So what are the pros and cons of gallium nitride? The pros first, um, obviously we have a high breakdown field as we described earlier, uh, uh, an order of magnitude higher than that in silicon and gallium arsenide, and hence we can apply a much larger voltage across the terminals of the device. Also, we have the ability to sustain high DC NRF currents. Uh, this is thanks to the uh, two deck, the two-dimensional electron gas, which has got a sheet charge density of the order of 10 to the 13 uh, per centimeter square. This is a factor of five times larger than uh, um, transistors built on aluminium gallium arsenide, gallium arsenide. You can achieve uh, very high power densities with gallium nitride, 10 to 12 watts per millimeters of gate periphery, which is much higher than gallium arsenide, which can only achieve 1 to 1.5 watts per millimeter. Because you can apply a uh, much larger voltage at the output of the device, impedance being voltage divided by current, you end up with a much higher uh, output impedance, and hence power combining becomes much easier because the transformation ratios are lower. You have very good thermal properties, because if thanks to the silicon carbide substrate. Of course, if the device is built on different substrates, uh, uh, the thermal properties may not be quite as good. And you also have improved linearity and uh, um, the possibility of designing amplifiers with higher efficiency. 
Let's have a look at the cons now. Well, as we will see in due course, uh, the uh, material fabrication is not as advanced and well established as silicon or gallium arsenide, so you end up having some traps which are due to defects in the uh, material. And these traps actually create some uh, current uh, dispersion, so the current ends up being lower than what you'd expect. So uh, it is difficult to control uh, the trap density during fabrication, although, the, of course, the fabrication processes are, are, are improving. Uh, reliability and reproducibility are still a bit of an issue in that, um, obviously, there isn't as much data as there is on silicon and gallium arsenide in terms of reliability. And reproducibility, again, because it's difficult to control uh, traps and material quality. Um, uh, there may be some variation between batches. And it's, of course, a relatively mature technology, as we've been saying, um, and hence uh, it's got some teething problems, like every new technology. Now, let's talk about something which is um, very important in gallium nitride, and that is polarization effects. So, let's try and explain this in a bit more detail. Uh, polarization effects uh, in GAN uh, do influence greatly the current confinement at the hetero interface. When we uh, est try and estimate uh, the uh, two deg uh, density, so the, the sheet electron density in the two-dimensional electron gas, with conventional techniques, um, inevitably uh, we end up underestimating this concentration. And this is because of uh, the uh, polarization effects that exist in GAN. There are two types of polarization contributing to the total polarization in ALGAN and GAN compound structures. And these are spontaneous and piezoelectric polarization. The spontaneous polarization refers to the built-in polarization field present in an unstrained crystal. The piezoelectric polarization is the polarization field resulting from distortions of the crystal lattice. So, what do we mean by distortions of the crystal lattice? Now, uh, the problem here is that aluminium gallium nitride and gallium nitride have different lattice constants. So the atoms are at uh, different distances between one another. So when you try to grow um, a uh, structure like aluminium gallium nitride on gallium nitride, you're basically trying to match a, a wider lattice to a narrower lattice. And what tends to happen is that this is possible, but this lattice gets compressed. So you basically have these atoms in the top layer which uh, have kind of been strained and compressed to accommodate the lattice of the layer that they're grown upon. Because of this, you end up having the charges within the atoms being offset somewhat. So your nuclei and your uh, electron clouds are not the same as they used to be because you've basically compressed the lattice, you're putting some strain on it. And because of this, then the, uh, the, the charges end up being uh, in such positions that they create some sort of electric field. For example, um, this is for gallium arsenide. Uh, when a layer of indium gallium arsenide is, is grown in between gallium arsenide and aluminium gallium arsenide, uh, this is compressed. Um, it can be done, but obviously compressive strain uh, will um, be experienced by the indium gallium arsenide layer. Now, let's have a look at the polarization charges distribution uh, within the uh, aluminium gallium nitride and gallium nitride structures. So, uh, the aluminium gallium nitride will have some spontaneous polarization, which is um, normal, and also the gallium nitride will have its own spontaneous polarization. However, because of the strain that the aluminium gallium nitride layer experiences um, being grown on a buffer uh, of gallium nitride, which has got a very different lattice constant, we end up having some piezoelectric polarization in the ALGAN layer. When we sum the contributions of spontaneous polarization and piezoelectric polarization together, we end up uh, with what we can see at the, on the right-hand side of this picture. So you end up uh, with a net uh, polarization uh, charges distribution as shown in the figure. This diagram shows the uh, gallium nitride conduction band. 
uh, which basically helps us uh, work out uh, whether we've got a uh, two deg or not. Now you can see that if you neglect the polarization, uh, it would appear as if no two deg can be formed. If spontaneous polarization is neglected, uh, then uh, you get uh, a, an underestimation of, uh, of the depth of the uh, quantum well which confines your two-dimensional electron gas. However, when both polarizations are taken into account, then you get uh, the spike in the conduction band which represents the quantum well where the electrons can be confined with all the advantages that we discussed earlier. Now, an important topic uh, which is related to polarization in gallium nitride is uh, that of surface states. Now, when we're growing the Al-GAN layer uh, on the GAN buffer, as the layer thickness increases, uh, the internal electric field which is created becomes high enough to ionize the donor states at the surface. So again, if we go back to this picture, we've got uh, the electric field there, which is due to the uh, net induced polarization charges, which increases further and further. And as it increases further, it can take charges away from the surface of the algan layer and sweep them down to the interface. So these electrons drift down towards the algan gan interface and when the equilibrium is reached a two-dimensional electron gas charge at the interface will be generated due to the electrons which are transferred and a positive charge on the surface will be formed by the ionized donors the atoms that are left there deprived of electrons so if we take a look at this picture we can see this is the electric field that uh, takes the electrons away from the surface, takes them down to the interface, and here they fall into the quantum well, and they'll be confined within the two deg. At this stage, we must point out that a positive sheet charge must exist at the surface of the algan layer in order for a two deg to be present. Now, let's talk a little bit about virtual gate. Uh, which is a, was a very important problem in the early days of gallium nitride and is directly related to the existence of these surface states uh, at the surface of the algan layer. Remember that these uh, states cannot be eliminated because if you take them out, they are not going to have the same um, charge density in your two deck. So the problem with these surface states is that electrons may be trapped in the access region between the metal contacts between the gate and the drain. If this happens, uh, some of the electrons from the gate will uh, go on to occupy some of the surface states. This negative charge on the surface leads to an extension of the gate depletion region, as you can see in the picture. So now, effectively, uh, there exist two gates on the surface between the source and the drain, which are connected in series, as is shown in, in the picture here. The potential of the second gate, the virtual gate, is controlled by the total amount of trapped charge in the gate-drain access regions. So what can we do about surface states? Well, it was found that if you use silicon nitride passivation at the surface of the algan layer, then uh, you um, basically counteract the deleterious effect of um, uh, surface states and of electrons being trapped within them. As you can see in this graph, which is, was not obtained by me, it comes from a research paper, um, you can see that the solid line uh, represents the uh, IV curve before passivation and the dotted line represents uh, the curve after silicon nitride passivation. And you can see how the current is uh, considerably higher when you um, passivate the surface of the algan with silicon nitride. So 
surface states, you know, we have some means of uh, working with. But there are also going to be buffer traps. So in your gallium nitride layer, there's going to be uh, tra traps that could uh, kidnap your electrons and take them away from conduction and hence create uh, problems in, in terms of performance. So what happens then in, in the GAN buffer layer? Well, uh, under high electric field condition, because you have a high drain to source voltage, the electrons which are moving in the two deg uh, could actually be injected into the, into the buffer traps and stay trapped there. Because there are quite long time constants for these traps, um, some of the order of milliseconds, but also as we will see shortly, some of the orders of tens or hundreds of seconds, the trapped electrons cannot follow the high frequency signals and hence they're not available for conduction. These trapped electrons also produce a negative charge which again uh, acts to deplete the two deg and therefore reduce the channel current further. Now uh, we'll talk about a phenomenon called current collapse which is attributed to this type of traps. So you can see that there is a drain current reduction for VDS lower than 8 volts. And this reduction in current is observed uh, when a high uh, drain voltage is applied and then uh, the drain voltage is taken uh, back down to uh, 208 volts. So this type of effect is attributed to uh, hot electron injection and uh, trapping in the buffer layer and is unaffected by surface passivation. Current collapse, which is what we refer uh, to this effect uh, as, uh, is usually due to, uh, to this type of traps and the, the surface is not really involved. So buffer traps in gallium nitride transistors also can have time constants of 10 or hundreds of seconds, which are considerably longer than those encountered in gallium arsenide. And this, of course, greatly affects the characteristics um, of these devices, uh, the, uh, and hence the pulse IV characterization which you carry out, and which sometimes is used to provide simulation models, for instance, for the transistor, must be carried out in the appropriate manner. Now, I had the opportunity to work on this directly myself at the University of Sydney, where they have a bespoke characterization system for gallium nitride. And um, basically the way the measurement is performed, you just maintain the transistor at a constant bias for most of the time, and periodically you apply a short pulse to both gate and drain, and you measure the drain current. Now commercially available pulse IV systems uh, can do this sort of pulses of the order of uh, hundreds of milliseconds. But if you have time constants for the traps of the order of seconds, tens of seconds, or hundreds of seconds, then you need longer pulses to identify them. However, this brings about the issue of self-heating because you're keeping the device biased for longer and hence it will heat up and the curves will be affected uh, by this, this um, uh, heating. However, uh, the effects of self-heating can be easily isolated. So um, you can still uh, have long pulses which allow you to identify long uh, time constant traps and um, be able to then take the self-heating effect uh, out of your results, uh, isolate them, and, and model them. Uh, this is an example. This is data that I measured myself on a Nitronix device. It's a 25 watts uh, transistor. And you can see that when you're using pulses um, of about 1 second or 10 seconds, uh, you end up having uh, curves which are inconsistent with one another. The way you work out that the uh, pulse width that you're using is not sufficient is that you uh, repeat the measurement in a different order. So you explore different points in the characteristic uh, in different orders. That's why here we're saying shuffle um, or and step and sweep. And, um, and then you end up with different curves. If uh, you've chosen the uh, right uh, pulse length for your uh, IV characterization, then it shouldn't really matter which way you go around the characteristic. You should always get a, uh, the same curve.
And we can see here that when you're using 100 seconds, this is the case. Now let's have a look at the Cree transistor. This is a 10 watts uh, Cree transistor on gallium nitride, a uh, gallium nitride hemped. And you can see that um, the effects are less pronounced than in the nitronics. This could be due to the fact that the nitronics devices are built on uh, silicon. Cree devices instead are built on silicon carbide, and there is a um, less of a mismatch between the lattices of gallium nitride and silicon carbide, and hence perhaps you get less buffer traps and, um, and the device behaves a bit better. You can see that after uh, the time is increased over 100 seconds for your pulses, all the curves overlap and uh, there, is, there is no difference in the way you go around them or in the length of pulse that you use. Now you can also see some drain current transients which are again attributed usually to uh, buffer traps. For example, for the Nitronics device here, you can see a considerable increase in the current at that specific instant in time. So the way these tests are carried out is that you bias the transistor and you keep it at that bias for a long time and see if there is any change. Theoretically, uh, you should get an almost instantaneous uh, onset of current, but in, in this case, there is a gate lag. So there is a delay in the start of the rising slope of the current, and it, this is dependent on both gate and drain bias. In the Cree transistor, with an identical test, uh, we didn't observe that phenomenon, although you can see that at the top end of the curves, you start getting some roll-off. And this roll-off is typical of cell heating, so the device is, uh, is getting hotter, and hence the current available uh, for conduction becomes lower. So how can we find a way around the issues that are encountered um, in gallium nitride transistors? Well, we've seen that surface passivation can uh, counteract the deleterious effects of surface states. Also, if we improve the crystal purity and the fabrication processes, that uh, will also um, improve uh, the performance of the devices because, for example, it will reduce the um, density of buffer traps. There has been some work also on using uh, ultraviolet light illumination to uh, counteract these effects. Basically, uh, the photons um, have uh, an energy which is sufficient to occupy some of the traps. And because the traps are occupied by the photons, then the electrons won't get in there, and hence you don't get a reduction in current. And uh, you will be able to find some more information on this on the references that you'll be given. We can also improve the performance of the uh, gallium nitride transistors further by using field plates. When high drain voltages are applied to our transistor, electrons may leak out of the gate electrode and end up in the region between the gate and the drain. This may lead to gate breakdown because these electrons can accumulate in a specific um, spatial position in the device and create really high fills that ultimately lead to gate breakdown. So if we can increase the uh, drain voltage further, as we've seen during this presentation, we can increase the power capabilities of our device. Now uh, if we can find a way to counteract the, uh, the problem of uh, electrons leaking out of the gate when high drain voltages are applied, uh, this could allow us to improve the performance. And field plates are used to do just that, and um, they have been used to uh, produce devices which are capable of uh, drain voltages of over 120 volts. We can see here uh, how a field plate is constructed. They're basically extensions of your gate electrode, and they help spread out the density of the field, and they hence avoid spots in the device where the electric field is so great that then it causes breakdown. The problem with having an extension of the gate electrode is that they basically introduce um, a uh, higher capacitance and hence they reduce the maximum oper operating frequency of the transistor. Some other research teams have come out with a different idea. They thought, well, we can use a second field plate and then connect that to the source. 
and um, the field plate uh, channel capacitance uh, in this manner becomes the drain to source capacitance and a drain to source capacitance can be then tuned out with your output network this way you eliminate the problem of having additional capacitance between the gate and drain electrodes and hence you don't damage your frequency performance. So let's talk a little bit about now uh, the uh, commercial availability of gallium nitride transistors. They've been around for quite a few years now. Um, I started working on them back in 2006 and I've seen uh, an incredible amount of progress and in the last few years I've seen considerable improvements in uh, the frequency capabilities of these devices, in the output power they can produce, and uh, there's also been uh, new companies joining in uh, and uh, putting devices out into this market. You can see that um, up to uh, 6 gigahertz um, you get uh, very good performance from the Cree devices which I worked with uh, extensively. At around uh, 2 gigs uh, you get a really high power device fabricated by uh, SEDI which is a Sumitomo Electric Device Innovation. It was called formerly uh, Udina Devices. And then when you go further up in frequency, uh, Cree have managed to extend their range up to 11 gigahertz. And uh, above that, we get um, Toshiba, uh, who are able to produce uh, about 50 watts at over 14 gigs of frequency, which is very, very good. Um, and also we get um, uh, Triquint and um, Fujitsu, uh, who are able to go up to 18 gigahertz in frequency. Uh, and uh, I've uh, managed to work with some of the tri devices, which, uh, which are very interesting. So uh, this is a table uh, that shows you uh, the uh, top of the range devices for each manufacturer. Uh, we're talking about top of the range either in frequency capabilities or in output power or both. And um, you can see that um, Cree offers a, a good range of devices up to 11 gigahertz. Um, other companies can offer also offer devices, but usually below the 6 gigahertz uh, mark. Uh, if you want to go to really high frequency, then uh, TriQuint uh, would be probably your best bet. So, in conclusion... Wideband gap semiconductors uh, such as silicon carbide and gallium nitride uh, can offer an order of magnitude improved RF upper power compared to traditional devices. And hence, uh, they are the first devices really that uh, for a long time uh, have been able to um, improve um, high frequency performance and shift it up in power. And uh, they also um, are very good candidates for the replacement of vacuum electron devices, uh, which are uh, bulky and expensive, and have got all the disadvantages that we talked about earlier. GAN transistors, of course, uh, help you reduce the complexity and the size of the overall amplifier, uh, but they still maintain very good level of efficiency and linearity. There are, of course, issues with this material um, which limit uh, the performance of the gallium nitride uh, transistors, but new solutions continue to emerge, and as I mentioned, I've seen a tremendous improvement in the last four to five years, both in output power and frequency capabilities. Well, I would like to thank you for your attention. I hope you've enjoyed this seminar, and I look forward to answering your questions on Twitter. Thank you very much for attending. Goodbye.